All right, it's Monday, it's week three. We're gonna start a new unit of material today called recursion. Um, let me think, are there any announcements that I have for you? Uh, I guess the main thing is, you know, you should be working on homework two this week. I definitely want to encourage you to work with a partner. If you don't have a partner and you're looking for one, uh, we'll try to help you find one. Let us know, go post on Piazza. There's a thread called uh, looking for partners or something like that. Um, ask your section leader, ask the TAs and myself. We would be happy to try to help you find a partner if you want a partner. I strongly recommend it. It's somebody you can talk to and work with and it makes it easier to figure things out. Um, so yeah, uh, this week we're doing recursion. And I wanna warn you, I think this is the first really uh, tricky topic that we're gonna hit in this class. I mean, I think all the material is challenging and interesting and so on, but this stuff is the first material where you really have to just learn a new way of thinking about programming. And I would say that it, a lot of students find it challenging, and it takes most students a while to get the hang of it. So like, if you leave class today and you're like, I don't know what the hell he was talking about, <laughs> that's probably okay. You're probably not the only person who feels that way. It's just going to take lots of examples and lots of practice, and we're going to do sections on this, and we're going to spend all week talking about this recursion concept. And most of next week, we're also going to be talking about different applications of this recursion stuff. So like, it doesn't, it doesn't always make sense right away, uh, but eventually, I think you will become comfortable thinking in this way about programs. So having said that, you know, I think this is a topic, since it's so tricky, I think it's especially a, a good topic to practice, do exercises on, on your own, maybe code step by step or book problems, maybe read through the chapter. I've got some videos posted on the lecture calendar of the website. Not only will I post my lecture video, but I have videos of other people explaining recursion because sometimes the way I explain it doesn't make sense to you because of your way of thinking or your learning style. So go watch some other people. I've got some, some other instructors, both from Stanford and other schools, and, uh, who I greatly re respect and admire. And, and I've got videos of them explaining recursion. So if you go watch and read and practice all that stuff, I think the chances that you'll be rocking on recursion uh, go up. So anyway, that's the topic for this week. It comes from chapter seven of the textbook. Let's dive into it. Recursion is when you describe something in terms of itself. So what I mean by that is you're trying to solve a problem and maybe your algorithm or your process for solving that problem involves solving smaller or simpler versions of that same problem. What, it sounds like I'm talking in riddles or something, but like uh, a lot of algorithms have this quality whether you realize it or not. For example, the algorithm of how to look up a word in the dictionary the algorithm is you turn to the page that has that word and you read the definition, but sometimes the definition has fancy words in it that you don't know the meaning of. <laughs> so what do you do? You look them up. <laughs> so the process of looking up a word in the dictionary might involve looking up words in the dictionary, right? Now that introduces the danger that maybe you keep spiraling out of control looking up words and looking up words and looking up words forever. Eventually the process stops, right? When does it stop? Yes? When you understand every word you looked at? Yeah, when you look up the definition of, of everything that you're trying to understand and you know the meaning of every word in that definition, then you don't have to go looking up any further words. Now you're done. Right. So at some point, this self-repetition ceases. But that self-repetition, as part of the description of the algorithm, is both valid and uh, elegant. There's also lots of structures when you're coding that are somewhat recursive or similar to themselves. Like when you have a directory structure of files on your hard drive, file, folders contain folders which can contain folders. You also see things like uh, 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 data, like family trees, you know, that, that are sort of self-similar. Uh, parents and children, the children can become parents of other children and so forth. There's also lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, occurrences of this in science and nature, just uh, you know, breeding patterns of animals and cloud formations and, and that weird broccoli stuff with the spirally patterns and shells. And there's all kinds of things where you see smaller and smaller occurrences of the same pattern, like self-similar patterns or algorithms in nature. Uh, well, later this week, we'll talk about you can actually draw graphics where you repeat smaller occurrences or larger occurrences of the same pattern nested inside themselves, and those are called fractals. Those are really cool. You can use recursive 
self-similar descriptions to draw patterns like that. So yeah, I mean, this is a concept, and you can apply this concept to programming. So I want to talk about a non-programming example first. What if you got a big bowl of candies like M&Ms? Now, full disclosure, if I were a nice person, I would have actually brought a bowl full of candy, and I would have done this with the candy, and then you all get to eat candy, and then you all like me. But I'm not Maron, and I'm a horrible, <laughs> heartless person who's dead on the inside. And I didn't bring you any candy, I'm sorry. So uh, eat your own candy if you have any. But let's just talk about candy at 11.40 when it's lunchtime. Um, suppose there's a big bowl of candies. It's got a bunch of M&Ms in it. And we want to double how many there are. So if it has, you know, N M&Ms, we want it to have two N M&Ms, right? So, I mean, mostly what you would do is you just count the M&Ms. You pull them out and count them up. And then whatever n is, you pour that many more in there, and now you're done, right? But let's pretend that we go to Berkeley, so we are not able to count. Uh, we don't know how to count. But we are legion. There are many of us. We are all... <laughs> all of us not able to count people could perhaps combine our primitive intellectual powers to solving this very tricky problem. So what does this have to do with recursion? Well, recursion is when you have an algorithm that sort of refers to itself in a smaller form in some way. So like the algorithm of drawing that pattern is you draw this, and then inside of it, you draw a smaller version of this, and inside of that, you draw a smaller version of this. So same idea, looking up a dictionary word, you look up other words. Is this problem a problem that has some self-similarity to it? Is doubling m and m similar to doubling some other amount of m and ms That's kind of the self-similar uh, way of thinking about a problem. So here's what I'm really getting at. If there's so many of us, Let's assume that the number of M&Ms in the bowl is fewer than the number of us. Okay? So if we all talked and came up with a common algorithm that everyone was going to follow, exactly the same algorithm. The algorithm can have if-elses in it or whatever, but the algorithm can't involve one hero doing all the work. I got it, guys. I'll count them all up and I'll put the new ones in. You, you each have to do a small amount of the work. And we have to work together. How can each of us help a little bit in doubling the number of M&Ms in a bowl? It's a little bit tricky. Um, does anybody have any, any ideas or thoughts or anything? What, do you have a suggestion? Okay, uh, what, what you said was everyone picks up one M&M, and then what? Okay, so, so if we have our existing bowl that we want to double, and then we have a giant supply of additional M&Ms that we want to use to do the doubling, you're saying each of us could follow the algorithm of grab one from the bowl, and also grab one from the big supply, and now I've got two M&Ms, now what do I do with those? Put it into a destination, and now if everybody does that, then by the end the bowl has we have twice as many M&Ms, right? Yeah, I think that's great. That's, a, that's an excellent uh, like seed of an overall approach, right? And it's got the right mindset. It's like everybody does a little share of the work. That's the sort of recursive way of thinking. Little workers helping each other, kind of, right? Okay, what if I make, I mean, I think that's generally the right answer, but um, what if I make it just slightly more, a little more constrained, where you were kind of describing this extra bowl, this dumping ground where as we take the one and then the spare one, we go put them over there. But maybe let's constrain the problem to say, we only have the one bowl and the infinite supply. And anything that we're putting in somewhere has to go in our bowl. So if I do what you said, and I take one out and I put two in, they're going to go right back in the bowl that we have, that we're trying to double. So I'm a little worried that like if 10 people do that, <coughs> I won't know how many people should do that before I should stop. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I think your description was assuming that the bowl was going to empty out and we were going to fill some other bowl, right? And that would totally work if you were doing
doing that. But I'm going to be mean and say there is no other bowl. We have to do it in the bowl we have. Right? So can we tweak his excellent idea to work in my constrained new version of the problem? Yeah. Is M&M still in bowl if one M&M and then Right, right. What she said was, um, take out your M&M &M and take out its pair, its partner from the supply, and now just chill out for a second. <laughs> Don't put them back in anywhere yet, just hold them. And now sort of pass on the bowl to the next person, or let other people have a turn to do this. And repeatedly, people are going to do that. They're going to pull one out, and then they're holding two. Pull one out, they're holding two. Eventually, somebody grabs the last M&M &M out of the bowl, and they grab a partner for it, and there's nothing left in the bowl. And you've got a bunch of people standing around holding two M&Ms. And you say, everyone, put them back in now. We're done. And everyone dumps their two M&Ms in. You've doubled the number of bowls in the, in the uh, no, doubled the number of M&Ms in the bowl. That's exactly right. And you even were kind of using pseudocode to describe. You said, if bowl has M&Ms. Like, I think that's the right approach. And that's kind of how I've thought of it. Like, if the bowl is empty or, or whatever, there's nothing to do. But otherwise, take an M&M out, pass it along, wait for it to come back and then put your two in. And so again, the, you might, maybe it's not quite clear how the problem is self-similar. Because remember, the whole idea of recursion is the problem is supposed to be similar to another version of itself. But if you want to state it a certain way, you would say, I'm doubling this bowl. So my algorithm is take one out, turn to the person <laughs> next to me and say, hey, would you please double this bowl? Which is not the same as my bowl, because it's different by one and the next, right? So, hey, you, would you double this slightly different bowl? Wait for them to say, I have completed my test. Here is your double bowl. And now I put my two M&Ms into that. The idea is like, let's see, if there were five M&Ms in the bowl, that's, that's so few that the problem sounds kind of trivial. But if there were only five in there, and I pluck one out, I've got a bowl of four. And I say, golly, since I can't count, I don't know how to double a bowl of four, but can you help me with this? person next to me, and they go, okay, I'll try, and they go all the way down until it's you know, one and zero or whatever, and then, you know, as it gets passed back along, eventually the person who was asked to double the bowl of four has a bowl of eight, and they say, here, and I say, wow, that was cool, like, I don't know how to double a bowl of five, but that person was super helpful, they doubled this bowl of four to eight, so now I'll just put two more in, so now that's the double of a bowl of five. You understand? So it's like we're all following this double the number of M&Ms in the bowl algorithm. We're describing the algorithm in terms of itself. That's the bold part. It's almost like it's a function. They're all running, and they call the function on each other to do some of the work. You know, this example makes sense, sort of. Anyway, it, you might say the constraints are a bit artificial. Why can't I just count for Pete's sake? Well, sure. Okay, if you could just count the M and M's, that's you know, in some ways that's an easier algorithm to describe, but you have to admit it does require a bigger brain and a smarter person willing to do all of the work themselves rather than a bunch of willing people who don't have to know very much to do their share. Uh, yeah, question? Did this work just to sort of infinite chain? Because you could eventually want to pass that if the person then pulls Is it going to lead to an infinite chain? Well, the part that says if full empty is really important because, like, if there's 10 M&Ms in the bowl and we start here, and you say, well, I can't, I can't double a bowl of 10, but I'll take one out and I'll ask him to double a bowl of 9. It goes all the way down until the bowl of 0, and that person says, doubling a bowl of 0, there's nothing to do, so they just hand it back. So it gets handed along one direction while you're pulling out the M&M, and as you're coming back and putting in the 2, it kind of goes back the way it came and ends up in the hands of the same person that we started with. And then they say, Yes, I have finished doubling the bowl. Here it is. And they hand it back to the original requester, which would be me or whatever. And so it doesn't go for it. I think maybe what you're worried about is like you pass it along and you pass it back and then you keep passing it other places or something. But I think there's a notion of an entry point where someone makes the original request for the doubling and that person is handed the result at the end. I don't know if I'm answering your question for Sorry, I'm worried that when you're passing it back, the bowl not going to be empty anymore and it's going to trigger the initial Oh, well, well, okay, uh, I see. So as you're passing it back, it's not empty anymore. But I think they check this test as they first receive the bowl. Each person who's handed the bowl says, at this moment, is it empty? 
no, okay, well, I'll grab it or whatever. And they, they begin their else kind of. Once they're locked in on that, that's where they are again. When the ball comes back, they continue to else it. So, I mean, it ends up working out. It's a kind of a silly example, but I think it's the, it illustrates kind of what we're talking about here. Let, let's look at some actual code. I think the, the real uh, C++ code might be helpful to look at. So recursive programming is when you write a function that calls itself. You ever do that? You ever get a function where you get to the bottom and you're like, I want to go back to the top. So you call your own function and it jumps you back up. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, interestingly, recursion is just as powerful and can do just as many things as loops can do. So there are actually entire programming languages called functional programming languages that don't really even have loops. All they have is functions that can call functions and somehow you can write entire programs that way. It's kind of interesting. Someday maybe you'll learn a functional programming language. Uh, C++ is not such a language, but that's okay. Um, anyway, we're gonna use recursion and recursive programming a lot in the rest of this course. So when you write recursive programs and code, there's, there's definitely uh, two kinds of cases that you have to worry about in those functions. In general, your function calls itself, but at some point you have to stop calling yourself. In the case of the M&M &M problem, we had to have this if-else kind of logic that says if there's no M&Ms in the bowl, I need to stop and go back, sort of. So this sort of stop case where you stop calling yourself, that's often referred to as a base case. And I'll show you, uh, when I show you a specific example, I think it'll make sense, but a base case is where your function does not need to call itself. It could just answer the question with the information in its hands already. The recursive case is a more complicated case where you do have to call yourself. So when you're writing a recursive function, the general philosophy that you should have is, I'm gonna have my function call itself a lot of times. Each of those calls is like one person helping double the M&Ms, in the sense that each call should do a small portion of the overall work. And collectively, all the calls will combine to do the total amount of work. So a key question is, how is this problem similar to itself? How would it be helpful for me to get some other version of this solution? How would that help me do what I need to do? So let's look at a specific example. A lot of recursion um, Books and, and examples start with the idea of computing a factorial, which is just the product of the integers from one to n. This is not recursive. This is a for loop. I start with one and I multiply by each int i up through n. That's, that's n factorial, right? It, for for non-negative numbers. Okay? That's not very interesting, it's not very hard. But one thing that you notice, if you look at this pattern, like four factorial is four times three times two times one, right? I guess this thing computes it going up one times two times three times four, but you know, same idea. Five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. Hey, look, five factorial is just five times four factorial, right? So if I were trying to write the factorial function, I could use this relationship in my code. Let's, let's do that. Let me open Qt Creator. Uh, I'm gonna open this file I have called uh, recursionprobs.cpp. Got a bunch of different functions in here, but I want to write, where is it? Uh, oh, I don't have a header for it. Int factorial, int n. So we just said that five factorial equals five times four factorial, right? So you could basically say that in the code. You can say, if I, n is five, so you can say return n times what? n minus one. Okay, but that is not a complete solution. Do you understand what's wrong with this solution? What's wrong with it? Yeah. It never ends because factorial five calls factorial four, factorial four calls three, three calls two, two calls one, one calls zero, zero calls negative one, negative one calls negative two. It just spirals into infinite calls. This will eventually crash your program. It's called a stack overflow because your functions stack up their memory and eventually there's too many and it overflows the amount of memory that you have. You maybe have heard of a website called Stack Overflow. That's a joke on this concept of too many recursive function calls. Um, so this is where we need something called a base case. We have to tell the algorithm to stop doing this self-calling at some point. So the idea is most recursive code has some kind of if else. You say if something else uh, something. And the, the distinction of the if-else is that you sort of have what's usually called a base case and what's called a recursive case. And the base case is like, 
I don't need to call myself because this version of the question is easy enough, I can just answer it. So the question you want to ask yourself is like, what number is it easy to compute the factorial of? I heard one and I heard zero. Those are both numbers that have the factorial of one. Zero factorial is defined to be one. One factorial is defined to be one. So you could do something like, you know, if n is zero or n is one, then just return one. I don't need to call factorial of something. It's just easy. I could just answer it. Do you understand? But for numbers that are bigger than one, that's hard. So I'll call n times factorial of n minus 1. So I think the easy way to like, trace this in your head is like, what if I call factorial of 3? Well, what that's going to do is it's going to go into the else part of the code, right? Because 3 is not 0 or 1. So that'll lead to return 3 times factorial of 2, right? So then factorial of 2 needs to calculate its result. So factorial of 2 also goes into the else part of the code. And it says return 2 times factorial of 1. So that leads to a third call of you know, factorial 1, right? So factorial 1 hits this base case. And so it says return 1. Now one thing that a lot of students have trouble with is like, well, what does that mean, return 1? Return it to where? Well, it means return it to whoever called you. Who called you was here from the factorial of 2 call. So it returns this 1 up to here. So this thing becomes a 1. And so this factorial of 2 call returns 2 times 1. So that means this whole call returns, uh, or, sorry, becomes a, a 2. And then this returns 3 times 2. So this one returns out a 6. Do you understand? So like each call is waiting for the, la the next call to finish so that it can return out its answer. So that's kind of how this whole thing works. Um, and if you, if you want to see recursive code run, a good way to do that is to just put a C out statement at the start and say factorial parentheses plus n plus parentheses uh, plus indle. Just print the parameters. Just watch the function calls. And so up here in main, I'll say uh, factorial of 5. So I'll do uh, int f equals that, and then I'll do C out. Overall result equals f handle. Okay, so this is main. The top of the file is main here, and it's going to call the factorial that we wrote. Uh, use of undefined. Oh, I, I haven't got a prototype for this up, I have, up here. I have to have a prototype. <coughs> Sorry. Um, try again. <laughs> undefined main. That's because it says main rec. I got wrecked. Okay. Uh, there. That's right. Uh, yeah, so. It says factorial of 5, factorial of 4, factorial of 3, factorial of 2, factorial of 1. Overall result is 120. So it's making all these calls that call each other to compute the overall answer. Is this version better than the one with the for loop? Uh, you know, neither one's better. It's just a different way of thinking. I'm just showing you this as an initial example to understand how this mechanism works. I'm not saying this code is way better than the loop version, but we will see problems today and, and this week where the recursion version might be easier to write than the non-recursion version. You have any questions so far about this uh, function, about, about recursion, about what we've seen so far? Can you always substitute uh, like recursion with a loop? Could you always replace recursion with a loop or vice versa? Basically, yes, but that doesn't mean that the two versions are equally easy to write. Sometimes the loop version, you need to keep some data structures. And sometimes the recursion version, you need to do some tricks to get around the lack of the loops. And, and uh, you can always solve the same set of overall problems either way. But some problems are much easier or harder to solve one way than the other. Any other questions? Let's keep going and see what we can get to. Um, so I'm going to skip this. We already did that. We wrote that. So yeah, you call factorial of 4, which calls factorial of 3, which calls factorial of 2, which calls factorial of 1. And then that returns the result of 1 back to here, which returns the result of 2 times 1 back to here, which returns the result of 3 times 2 back to here, which returns the result of 4 times, what was it, 6 back to there. So it returns 24. I mean, these calls, I, th I think a big misconception that students have maybe is when they see these recursive calls, like, uh, they see this recursive call where n is 4. And they go, oh, it returns 4 times factorial of n minus 1. So n minus 1 is 3. So when they see the recursive call, they go, oh, OK. So it goes back up to the top again. When you call yourself, you go back to the top. That's sort of right. 
but it's missing something important. It's not that your function goes back to the top, it's that you spawn a new copy of the function, and that copy is at the top. And that's a really important distinction in certain cases. So like, that's why I drew this picture with these like, different rectangle versions of the function appearing, because what happens is not that it just goes to the top, it's that it waits for that other version to finish, and whatever the other version returns is used by me. Each of these calls has its own sort of identity to itself. So anyway, if that doesn't make a lot of sense, I think more examples will help. But um, let's, oops, how do I get out of this? Okay, wait. So I want to skip this example for a second. Uh, no, no, no. Here, okay. I'm gonna show you a piece of code that's kind of weird looking code. In fact, this one, it makes two recursive calls on itself. It's a, mu a function called mystery, and it has an if else. And sometimes it calls mystery twice. So what does it do? I'll give you a second to look at it, and then we'll talk through it together. If you can't solve it, it's okay. It's hard. Feel free to talk to your buddy if you want. Okay, uh, I know that not everybody's done working on this. I just, I have to keep moving. Um, somebody think they know what the answer is. Somebody want to be brave and share their answer. What, what do you think is the answer? Yeah, C, three, three, four, four, eight, eight. Uh, I think that's right. Um, I want to walk through the different calls that are made to help make sure people, you know, hopefully will understand why that might be the right answer. So if you look at the original call, that's the code. And so n is 348, right? So it doesn't go to the if. The if is false. It's not less than 10. So it goes to the else. So it calls mystery twice. It calls mystery on n divided by 10 and on n mod 10. n divided by 10 is everything except the last digit, right? That's 34. And n mod 10 is only the last digit. That's 8. So it splits off the 34 from the 8. So those are going to be two calls that come out of here. I'm going to focus on the first call first. So the first one is the 34 call. That is also not less than 10, right? So it again goes to the else. It splits up the two parts of the number, which I think are going to be the 3 from the 4, right? So int, or the, the, the int A call is going to use 3, and the int B call is going to use 4, right? So let's figure out what those do. So now the 3 call is less than 10. It hits that base case, that if part. It returns. 10 times n plus n. 10 times 3 plus 3 is 33, right? So this call returns 33. <laughs> this call here returns 10 times 4 plus 4. That returns 44. Another, you know, a key aspect here is where do these things return to? Do, do they jump all the way out to main? No, they return to the prior call that called them. So this 33 becomes this int a right here that my mouse is squiggling on. Do you understand that? And this 44 becomes this int b that my mouse is circling on. So I'm going to exit these two calls here. And the state of things is that a is 33 and b is 44. Okay. Now this guy's job is to return 100 times 33 <coughs> plus 44. right? 
So this one returns 3,344, 3,344. Do you notice that uh, you pass 34 and you get 3,344, right? So sometimes you can detect a pattern of what the heck is happening. Maybe you found a pattern. Uh, so this call here calculates a result of 3,344. Where does that result go to? What happens to that number? Yeah? It becomes this original call's int A. This guy's int A is 3,344. Now we have to trace a whole other call of int B, which is his n mod 10, which is 8. So we have to calculate the mystery of 8 to get his int B. So that pops up a call here with 8, which is less than 10. So it returns 10 times 8 plus 8, which is 88. So now I get all the way back to here. So A is 3344. B is 88. Eight. And so now I'm supposed to take 100 times A, which is 334400 plus 88. Eight. So the overall result is 334488. Eight, eight. So this is a really weird looking way of stuttering on the digits of an integer. So there's two of each digit. So that's what this mystery function really does. Anyway. <laughs> kind of turns your brain upside down to trace through all of this code. It may not make sense right away, but that's how this code executes. Do you have questions about this function or about this, the way we walk through it? If, you don't, if this doesn't make sense, download the zip file for today for the lecture code. This function is in there. Go edit the code and put some C out statements and then run it yourself and watch it and see what happens and, and you know, get to the point where the execution of this code makes more sense to you in your own way. Um, but drawing these kinds of diagrams where you trace out the different calls, that can be helpful. Let's see if we can solve another problem together. I want to write a function called isPalindrome. I want to see if a string is the same forwards as backwards. So if you were to reverse the string, would you have the same string? So of course, we could do this using a loop. You could loop over the characters and look at them and stuff. If you want to think of the problem that way, if that's helpful to you, maybe that will help us figure out the algorithm that we're going to write. But I don't want to write it using a loop. I want to write it using recursion. So we're not very good at recursion yet. We're just learning recursion. But there are some standard questions we can ask ourselves. The things I like to think about are, how is this problem self-similar? How is asking whether my string is a palindrome similar to asking whether some other string is a palindrome? That's a question we can think about. Another question we can think about is, if I have a whole bunch of workers, and each worker does a small amount of work, what is the sort of unit of work that each worker could take on? And would the work collectively add up to solve the overall problem? That's another way you can think about this. A third thing you can think about, I spoke about base cases and recursive cases. Every recursive problem has a base case, which is the easy version of the problem to solve. What are some easy strings to determine whether they are palindromes or not? We could think about that. Those are all useful things we could ask ourselves as we're trying to think of an algorithm. <laughs> if you were going to solve this problem using a loop, I mean, one thing you could do is you could reverse the string, and then you could say if they're equal to each other. But let's say that we don't get the, the ability to do that. We can look at the existing string to figure out the problem. We are allowed to use a loop. How would you do this using a loop, just sort of generally speaking? Yes? So, yes. Make a loop that starts at the first letter and see if it's equal to the last letter. And as your loop is going along, the second letter, you check for the second to last letter. The third letter, you check the third from the last letter. You loop along until you looked at the whole string. And if you saw no problems, that means it's a palindrome, right? That would be the kind of loopy version of this, right? So how do I slice and dice that work up into little chunks that each function can do a little bit of that work that you just described? What's the unit of work here? Uh, what do you say? So if I'm trying to do race car, 
you said that like I could have a first worker look at these edge letters and see if they're the same. And then the next worker, what do they do? So then the worker before them is going to ask them to like check if it's the same. So they're going to look at now A and A. So the next worker is going to look at A and A like that, right? Okay, and then the next worker is going to look at C. At some point, you're, you're done here. Um, so we're always talking about self-similarity, right? If I'm going to do a small part of this work and all I'm going to look at is R and R here, how is it, like, can you describe is palindrome in terms of is palindrome? Like, what is it about, like, I check the edges and then these other people do things? Like, I can check whether some other word other than race car is a palindrome. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, what other word do I want to know whether it is a palindrome or not? Yeah? Ace car? Yeah, like, what if I could just tell you I am an oracle of palindromes. I know everything about them. I know them forwards and backwards, which is to say I know them forwards. <laughs> Think about it. But, uh, and I know that Asaka is a palindrome. And you can ask me that, and I can tell you that. If you knew that, and your job was to know whether a race car was a palindrome, you'd be pretty much done, because you'd say, well, I'll check the R and the R. Those are good. And you, Oracle, told me that Asaka is a palindrome. So those two facts taken together, I have my answer, right? That's kind of the thought process of recursion. You don't have a magic Oracle, but your next call is going to go do a bunch of work with his buddies. And collectively, that will answer this difficult question of whether the rest of the word is a palindrome or not. So I think we can write this using the ideas that you gave me. So if we go to Cute Creator, I've got a function header called is palindrome here. <laughs> Right now, I'm very pessimistic about that. I just say return false. That's not right. So um, you said look at the first letter and the last letter. So OK, I can help you with that. Uh, the first letter is S bracket 0. It's of type care instead of string because it's just one character. The last letter, last, is S bracket uh, length minus 1, right? S dot length minus 1. OK? So I want to know that those are the same as each other. So I guess, um, you know, whenever you're returning a Boolean, you have this notion of should I stop early or should I continue? If I know that my letters are different, I don't actually need to ask about Asaka, right? Because if you ask for race cal, that's not going to work just because of the R and the L on the endpoints. So I think you could say, like, you know, if the first isn't equal to the last, then the whole word can't possibly be a palindrome, return false or something like that, right? But if, it, if they are equal, I need to know about the rest of the word. So, like, you know, I need to turn race car into ace car. So how do I, how do I turn race car into ace car? I do the substring slice off the characters, right? I think I heard you guys saying that. So I'll do, like, string middle equals s dot substring from one. Uh, then you pass the length, the number of characters, which would be the original length minus two characters, right? So s length minus two is the middle. So now I just want to know, is palindrome middle. That's my recursive call, right? This is the general idea of the algorithm. There's two problems with what I've written so far, but this is mostly the idea. Good start so far, right? So um, <clears throat> let, me, let me rephrase some of this code slightly, because I think it's most helpful to think about things kind of all as one test. Um, Really, I want to know that the first and the last are the same and that the middle is a palindrome. So I, if you'll allow me, I'd like to rephrase this code slightly. I'd like to say um, the following. Middle, I'd just like to declare all three of those right there first, OK? And now I'd like to say I want to know whether the first equals the last. And I'd also like to know and the rest is also a palindrome. Does that make sense? return true, else return false, like, like that. Is that OK with you guys? I just mushed the test together, right? I made it more affirmative, positive test instead of negative test. Same, same algorithm, though, right? OK, but there's one problem with this code. It's missing something that I think I said was important in recursion. What is missing in this code? It's missing, it's missing a base case. General tip, if it's recursion week and I ask a question, 
No matter what the question is, if you just say base case, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're not, it's probably close. Uh, yeah, base case is super important because without the base case, the recursion never stops. Uh, in this case, I mean, the code will try to do something, but at some point there's no substring. You can't slice two letters off. I think it'll crash with an illegal index on the string or something like that. So let's think about base cases. Usually, like, like this code that we wrote, all of this, all of this is the recursion case. So really what we should do is we should say, well, if something, then I don't even need to do all that stuff I wrote. If the string is easy to answer the question of, then I'll say it's a base case. But if it's not easy, then I'll do all this work right here. Right? What would be a string that's easy to decide whether it's a palindrome or not? And they haven't called this. What do you say? Yeah. If it's just one letter, it, it might be unclear what to do with a string like that. But yeah, basically, I think the test here is if you were to reverse it, would it change? A string that's only one letter long, the answer is no, it wouldn't change, right? So if s dot length is just one, then sort of by definition, it's a palindrome, right? And actually, an empty string, it's not clear what to do with that as well, but let's define the empty string to also be a palindrome. So I'm going to write less than or equal to one. If it's empty or one letter, it doesn't change upon reversal. I call it a palindrome. Otherwise, I'll go into this recursive case. And I'll chop off the letters, and I'll look at the middle. And if the first and the last letters are the same, and also the middle is a palindrome, I will return true. OK? Let's try it out. Uh, if I go up to my main, I've got some tests up here. Where is it? Uh, is palindrome. Is palindrome, madam true, race car true, Java false, race cars false, toy robot false. It's failing one test case. Uh, this one has some capitalization and lower casing <laughs> issue. Like I should say lowercase on S and then it will match case insensitively or whatever, but our algorithm is right. Um, if you, again, if you want to see this work and you don't quite see the, the flow here, the best way I think to get a start on that is to say C out is palindrome parentheses plus s or uh, less than s uh, quote endl something like that and then when you run it it's going to produce a lot of output in this case but it's going to say is palindrome madam which calls ada which calls d race car calls aska which calls kek which calls e uh, step on no pets false palindrome x true java false race cars false toy robot it works for the t's here it works for the o's here but then it gets to Y Rob in the middle and the Y and the B don't match and so it stops. And so you can watch these calls in the output if you want to see them. That can be helpful to see the process going along here. Okay. Slight improvement to this code. If you, if you ever have if return true, else return false, you can shorten that to say basically just return the result of that Boolean test. You can say return whether or not that test is true. That's a shorter way of saying the same thing. So that's a little bit better version of the same code. Okay? Palindrome checking. I want to do one more. We have about five or six minutes left. I think we can finish this. Uh, let me see, it's a couple slides ahead. I'm going to skip this one example that I'm not going to do today. Um, here, it's called the Towers of Hanoi. This is a classic. You ever seen one of these puzzles before? They make little toys of these you can put on your desk or whatever. The idea is, it's a little, little puzzle, a little game. You can take a disc off, there's these three pegs and these round uh, like donut discs that sit on the pegs. You can take a disc off one disc and move it and put it on a different peg. But there's a rule that you can't put a bigger disc on top of a smaller disc. So I can move number one to this middle peg, and I can take number two off, but I can't also put it on the middle peg because it'll go on top of number one. That's too big. I can move it to peg three, and then after that, I could move the small one here on to pick three on top. You understand? But I can't put a big guy on top of a small guy. So imagine if we're going to recursively solve Towers of Hanoi. And I'm going to pass you the parameter of how many disks there are and what peg they're on from 0, 1, or 2, and what peg I want you to move them to, which presumably is some peg other than the current starting peg. So, I claim this is much easier to solve recursively than it is with loops. Somebody over there was asking, like, can I always do it both ways? Yes, but I think this one, go try to solve this later using a loop. I think you'll find it frustrating, whereas this one, I think you could solve it 
short amount of code. So how do I actually write this thing? Well, I've got a GUI, a little graphic so we can animate, we can draw it. And there's a method we can use in the GUI called move disk. You move a single disk from one peg to another peg. You know, the idea is I want our algorithm to call that method many times to move all of the disks to the right uh, spot. You don't have to specify which disk. Implicitly, it just means move the top disk from the starting peg to the ending peg. So that's the idea. Now, OK, if you're going to solve this problem recursively, that means you have to think about self-similarity. If I need to move like five Hanoi disks from this peg to that peg, how is that task similar to moving some other disks or something, some other kind of disk movement? You know what I'm saying? Like, how is moving five disks for, to a peg similar to moving other disks in some way? It's kind of tricky, right? I think another way that you can think about this is I kind of use this language about a magical <laughs> oracle or something. It's like, what if your job is you have to move five disks and you've got a buddy who's willing to help, but they aren't willing to do all the work? They'll move some of them for you, but you have to do the rest yourself. How could I do my part? Do you know what I mean? <coughs> so that's kind of the mindset of recursion. Do you have any, any ideas, any thoughts? Um, I was thinking, so you could take the first one and put it on the second. Then, uh, yeah, so the green goes on on peg two. Yellow goes on peg three. Then now you're looking at peg two and you put the green on. overall set of moves that I think is going to start leading to an answer. Um, but I think one of the beautiful things about recursion is you can simplify even more than that. So I'm, I'm trying to move five disks. Let's pretend I have a function that can move four disks all at once. But I don't have a function that can move five, because that's just too many. <laughs> but I'm being asked to move five. So imagine you can move up to four at a time by like reaching and grabbing four and moving it. If I had that function, how would I use that function to solve my task of moving five? How do I move four to move five? What do you, what do you say? Yeah. You move four to the second one? If my goal is to get to the final peg, then move four to the second peg. Move the fifth one to the third peg. The fifth one to the third peg. And then call your movement of four backwards. And then move four to the third peg, right? But of course, alas, I don't have a function that moves four and no ideas. Well, shit, I guess we're stuck then, aren't we? But what if? What if recursion was magical? If recursion were magical, that would actually be kind of interesting. I only have a minute or two left, so I don't know if I can do justice to this, but let's try. I'm going to try to do this. So I've got move disks. So if I'm going to move, like, just I'll write values here to help this make sense. If I'm moving five disks from peg one to peg three, one thing that might be helpful is like, I want the number of the peg that isn't either of the other pegs. So I actually wrote a helper called uh, Hanoi GUI third peg number. If you pass start peg and end peg, like if I pass one and three, it'll return two or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It, it just helps me, like I don't have to write a bunch of if-elses of what the other peg is. If I had the magical function that could move four disks, the process looks something like move the disks of my number of disks minus one, move them from my starting peg to the third like temporary spot, the spot that I don't want to end up on. Move them from the start peg to the third peg. Then after that, I'll do my share of the work. All of them except for mine will be here. But I can move mine. That's my work. I'll move mine to the destination. So I will tell the GUI to move one disk from the start peg to the end peg. That's the part of the work that I'm doing. So now after that, I've got my guy, the biggest one, here, and all the rest of them here. And now I just need to move all the rest of them to the final peg. And so I'll say, please recursively move the rest of the disks from the third peg to the end peg. Does that make sense? No, I know. I know it's time to go, but 
One thing's important that's missing, right? What's missing? Base case. See, I told you that was always the right answer. What's a base case? What's an easy number of disks to move? One. <coughs> you guys are too Stanford-y. You're not being lazy enough. It's even easier to move zero disks. If the number of disks is zero, lol, do nothing. Otherwise, do this. The base case is you don't have to do anything. So wait, I know it's time to go, but hey, it's, I think this will be worth it if the code works. Watch this. It almost seems unbelievable. We didn't write code to do all that shit, but it just does it. Recursion is magic. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. <laughs>